To get the entire episode and all our content, look for a podcast of Biblical Proportions on all podcasting platforms. We apologize for the minor echoes in the recording. Hello everybody and welcome to a podcast of Biblical Proportions. Episode 9, Noah and the Flood Part 2, The Non-Hero. After discussing in our first episodes the legends of the creation of the world and the first humans, today we get to the Bible's first real hero, Noah or Noah. While the previous stories were short and straightforward and the human characters were flat and uninteresting, the heroic Noah has his tale spread over Genesis chapters 6 through 9. He builds an ark, takes in animals and survives the flood through his ingenuity, resourcefulness and quick thinking. Yeah, no. Noah's character is actually very dull and interchangeable. He does nothing but obey every order he gets without even a yes God. And then he gets drunk and exposes his genitals in front of his children. Haha, <laughs> classic Noah. But there's a whole lot to unpack in this story. The slow building suspense, Noah's loneliness in the ark, and the two deities who both decided to exterminate humanity. The same two gods we've grown to know and love, Elohim and Yahweh. Stitched together into one narrative. They drive the story forward and repeatedly go over their annihilation plans as if they are reveling in the carnage they left underwater. In our first episode about Noah, we discuss the historical, geographical and cultural context of the Bible's flood story and its hero. In this episode, we'll discuss the themes and hidden gems in the story. Hi Omri. Hi Gil. Before we start, we want to give a massive shout out to Michelle Collins, the first member of the show that we, we never even mentioned that we have a membership plan. And she just got onto our site, podcastofbiblicalproportions.com, and just did everything by herself. And we didn't even ask. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you, Michelle. So, Noah. The flood itself, as we talked in the last episode, it's a well known story, it's a well known myth that some say has some real memory to it like a real event from history memory to it. You need that uh, some kind of a preface or a prelude or prologue or whatever. And the prologue is unrelated completely to the grand narrative of the Bible. You have giants there, Nephilim. You have sons of, son of gods, like some kind of celestial beings. Uh, other interpretation much, much later uh, attribute to them uh, like angelic forces or uh, angels or some kind of a superhuman beings but it's like son of god in the context son of gods because the name here is elohim and not yahweh they're sons of elohim so you have like a prehistory conception that the rules that apply now to your day-to-day life your average mortality rate is like 60 years old 70 years old if you're lucky so back then, people lived until 1,000 years. Now you have uh, regular people doing day-to-day uh, stuff. But back then, you had sons of gods and Nephilim and giants who roamed the earth. So you need some kind of an explanation why they are not there anymore. Yes, and the reason that they are not there is because everything was horrible. Yeah, because people reproduced and they got bad out of it. The sex thing, there's a sex thing like as if it's uh, like a uh, yuck because they don't because they don't say why the world is shit. They just say that it is shit. Okay, the land was corrupted in front in, in the face of God and was full of Hamas. I think we talked about it in the last episode, but the word Hamas here in in English, I think it's the land was corrupted. The word Hamas is uh, also the, a name of a terrorist uh, slash uh, whatever you want to call it group uh, that controls uh, the Gaza Strip. It's also a word that describes pillaging. Mm. And taking by force. Yeah, exactly. So the memory of the destruction of the Bronze Age that we talked about it uh, in the last episode is very uh, vivid here by the use of the word Hamas. Because it's not only people were evildoers to, they, to their neighbors. It's a word that describes some kind of a, the feeling that you get from that word is some kind of an organized, disorganized groups that just pillage and rape and steal. So there's some kind of an ancient memory of a collapse of society. The minute that we got too large for our own good, 
And that's the, the distant memory of the, the turning point from um, hunter-gatherer society to agricultural societies. And the deal that you made with, the, with agriculture, basically, is that we, agri- agriculture will give you more food and you will reproduce more, but then we can't uh, vouch <laughs> for your safety afterward or how your society will go. Here is one of the reasons that why people became angrier, Uh, eviler because we moved away from the closest society w- in which you know most of the people that surrounding you to some kind of an abstract people yeah. way of looking at things after the introduction then Yahweh sees that the wickedness of man and all his urges and thoughts of his hearts only bad all day long <laughs> <laughs> that's a literal uh, translation <laughs> literal translation Only bad all day long. It's like people are always evil. <laughs> They're always evil. So, you know. But I think here all day long, it's literal. But I think uh, it's, it's like uh, the word in French, uh, toujours or mm-hmm. tout le monde. Toujours, it's like toujours. Uh, toujours is every day, every day but, it's, right. but it's, al- it's always. It's, it's always. Okay. So Yahweh, that makes him sad. Okay. His heart is sad. This is, this is the deity that we're talking about. He sees what is creation. Literally, the word for word here is, is he's being saddened into his heart. Yes, that's nice. Onto his heart. Yeah, it's very poetic. It's very nice. And then the next thing is that Yahweh says, I will exterminate the Jews. Uh, sorry, the, <laughs> the man that I created from the face of the earth. Yahweh and Elohim, they say and do the same thing in the story one after the other. Later, it was the land was corrupted in the face of Elohim, of gods, and then after the same thing was said about Yahweh. So this is like in your face, two deities in the story. It goes on and on. Everything that Yahweh does or says or feels, Elohim does, says or feels. And this is why it's four chapters long, because there's a lot of repetitions here. There's a repetitions and uh, dissimilarities as well. We, we can see, as we, we talked about in the cre- our creation episodes, that the Elohim par- uh, deity uh, is much less personal and more detached from human emotions. On the contrary, Yahweh is very emotional. If Yahweh was a goddess, then some uh, 19th century, early, early 20th century psychiatrist would have written uh, an article about how Yahweh is hysterical. Because he's saddened, and immediately afterwards, he wipes out all of his individual creations. So he's saddened, and then he says, I'm going to exterminate everything from the land and the, 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 and the, the birds. But he likes Noah. <laughs> so it reminded me a little bit of the George Carlin bit about uh, God loves you and he will, looks at everything you do and if you do something wrong he will put you in hell for it forever and ever and ever but he loves you <laughs> so this is like a crazy person <laughs> there's some kind of a play in words here in Hebrew it's much more uh, obvious not obvious but it's shouting louder from the text for example There's this root of nun, chet, mem, the sounds of N, nacham, and M, nacham, which is also, first, God, Yahweh, sees all of man's actions, and he's saddened. But the word before the word saddened is yenachem, which usually, usually means, in modern Hebrew, comfort. But here in this context, in the old version of the word, it's saddened. But it's specifically used because of its root. na Because later, God wipes. He wipes. And the word here is emcha. It's not the same ro- root, but it's the same sound. And back then, there weren't any um, linguistic faculties in universities. Scholarship wasn't even invented back then. The sound was more important than grammar. So there is Yinachem, Emache, Nachamti. And then Noach. This is the tale of Noach. All the Nuch that we have had, Noach. And then Noach Matzachen. Chen, that's inversion of Noach. It's, it's uh, Ch, N instead of N, Ch. Exactly. It's a 
brilliant trick, in my view, especially if you consider it a very, very old tale. Or I think it's a brilliant trick because I speak Hebrew and I uh, just uh, <laughs> figure and I and I notice that and I have a way to notice that. But Noah, his name is a word that its meaning is comfortable. Yeah, yeah. easy going <laughs> or easy going. Yeah. So there's this use of the root the words, the sounds that we spoke about earlier, and the hero that comes out of it is something, someone that God. Yahweh consider him easygoing and comfortable to work with. And the first thing that we thought about him is that he's a righteous and naive in his generations. And as we talked about in the last episode, the, w- the fact that he is comfortable to work with easygoing is very different than an epic tale about a grand hero, even from the Indian myths and the Mesopotamian myths, the Babylonian and the Greek. You have a hero, and it, I think it's some kind of a reoccurring theme throughout the stories of the Hebrews and the yeah. Jews. You can, you can contrast that to two movies about Noah. There's the movie Noah, 2011, with Russell Crowe, and then there's Evan Almighty with uh, Steve Carell. You can't make a movie about Noah the way that it was written, because as you said, it's not a character. Yeah, you will need a team of Hollywood uh, savvy writers to fill in all the blanks. In between. And to create his character, basically. So it's very apparent with Evan Almighty, also with Noah, there's like the hero's journey. They put that into this character, like he refuses the call at first for adventure. Or with, in the case of Evan Almighty, he refuses almost all, all the way through. This is not Noah. They are the, the, the two bosses that he has, Yahweh and Elohim. They macro-manage the shit out of everything. They tell him exactly how to build his ark, the dimensions, everything. They might as well do it themselves. A point about the two gods, for us it's obvious because we are into it. But for the listener and reader of that time and later on, it wasn't that obvious that it's two deities. Uh, if you take uh, as a fact that people wrote it, and if you l- listen to scholars and read uh, for yourself, then you will see the two traditions and two peoples that uh, had different stories and how it's a clear editing job here. But for the listener and reader, it's still the same God. Uh, I'm not sure I, uh, I agree with you. That at the time the, like the editing was done, it was done for a reason because this was the, their god this was their god but it's actually the same god it's like in hindu you know god is one it's a process it's a political process i don't think that the people who uh, worshipped elohim and the people who worshipped yahweh lived to hear the, this tale the complete tale elohim appears in a tale that was told many times and the tale that yahweh appears was told many times by different people. The moment that they got the entire story together, stitch it in a very crude crude editing job, I think there wasn't a person alive that remembered Elohim, maybe. That's only my, my opinion. Again, we're not scholars. Not biblical <laughs> scholars. Okay, but without being a biblical scholar, there are, you mentioned the uh, one difference between them. Uh, Yahweh is saddened and Elohim mm-hmm. is more uh, dispassionate. So uh, Yahweh, he's the one who says that uh, the, the nature of man is evil from his youth. This is something very emotional. Elohim doesn't, doesn't say that. It's like, uh, he's, again, it goes to the fact that he was saddened. And yeah. he's the one, when there's a covenant uh, at the end, he's the one that Noah builds a shrine for. Exactly. Doesn't he build a shrine for Elohim. Exactly. Elohim, that's exactly. the amorphous mm-hmm. God. Or maybe that the people who worshipped Elohim uh, no longer have shrines they, they got destroyed that's something that we may i don't know if we mentioned that but there's two people here every time one of those people was destroyed 150 years before scholars think think one of the first editions of the torah was formed was created yeah the torah the five f- first five books of the old testament somewhere in the seventh century BCE, it was formed in the kingdom of Judea. 
and it was 150 years after the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Israel in which the Canaanite gods and the Canaanite pantheon was much more relevant and much more pro- prominent. And the culture also. And the culture, because they were Norse, they, was clo- they were closer to the Canaanites and the Arameans and the Assyrians. Philistines and everybody. No, not Philistines, uh, Phoenicians, Phoenicians. Phoenicians and everybody, yeah. They got destroyed in the 8th century BCE. Destroyed, completely destroyed. And they moved, a lot of them moved. A lot of them migrated south, especially the elite, because the elite, they are always in danger when you have regime change. And they probably are more familiar with the story than the... Yeah, average uh, Shmuel. <laughs> <laughs> average, average Joe, Yosef. Yosef, average Yosef. <laughs> okay, Joe. To get the entire episode and all our content, look for a podcast of Biblical Proportions on all podcasting platforms.